Well, among those caught up in the events of 9-11 was Mark Rosenker. We know him as our CBS News transportation safety analyst, but he also served in the Bush White House. He was actually with President Bush on September 11th. Mark, tell us what your role was and describe what it was like being there at that time. Rena, my job was deputy assistant to the president and director of the White House military office. And the responsibilities included everything from Air Force One, Marine One, Camp David, White House Communications Agency, to the undisclosed locations, because I also had under my responsibility the continuity of the presidency and the continuity of government. That day, I will absolutely never forget. It was a day that, in fact, brought anger, brought dismay, brought disbelief to anyone and everyone who was clearly on board that aircraft at that time. And what I also was privileged to see was to actually watch with my own eyes the President of the United States turn from the chief executive to his commander in chief role and become a wartime president. It's pretty remarkable, Mark. For people who don't know, when the president travels, there's always a secure level of communications. You were in charge of that. It couldn't have been more helpful on a day like 9 11. But what was your initial reaction when you heard about the attacks? What was it like in that room? I was in the motorcade, and it was about two minutes before we arrived at the school when the Presidential Emergency Operations Center called me to say that an airplane had struck one of the towers. And I couldn't understand why I was one getting this call because I thought this was a small aircraft. There was no real additional backup information other than an airplane had struck. So I perceived this to be a small airplane that was operating in a low ceiling that couldn't see where he was operating from and came off the Hudson River and made a turn that he didn't see the building. Uh, it was only until we got into the holding room and we got hold of a television set and began watching the coverage that we began to understand that this was a commercial airliner. And then, of course, we we're watching this coverage while the president is doing his event in the schoolroom when the second plane live hit the second tower. At that point, we were looking around at each other in disbelief. Uh, Andy Card immediately went in to see the president and whisper in his ear in that very famous photograph where he says, Mr. President, a second plane has struck the World Trade Center. America is under attack. Mark, despite President Bush's demands to return to Washington, the Secret Service decided and said the safest thing to do was to keep Air Force One in the air. What was behind that decision? Well, we needed to understand what was happening. We understood, we, we saw, for example, and learned that the Pentagon had been struck after we had left the school on our way to Air Force One. And uh, at that point, we knew we could not go back to Washington. The president believed he needed to be in Washington. He was not going to be scared off by what was going on. But the Secret Service, uh, Andy Card, uh, myself, all agreed that this would not be an appropriate place to be yet. We needed to have the dust settle, the, the clear, the, the, the fog of war get, get somewhat blown away as we understood what was going on so that we could then decide where the safest place would be to take the president. And we ultimately decided to take him over to uh, Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana. We knew it was a secure base. There were B-52s there and there happened to have been a very large exercise going on, which enabled us to actually get into the base in a, in a secure way. So, Mark, ultimately, the Secret Service can override the Commander-in-Chief, the President of the United States? Well, we, we certainly don't want to, <laughs> to say, uh, Mr. President, we're in charge here, but the reality is, is we made some very persuasive arguments, and even though he disagreed with what we were saying, when the Vice President agreed in total with what we were saying, uh, he finally relented and said, OK, we needed to get on the ground so that the president could make a statement. We also needed it on, to get on the ground so we could pare down who was flying on Air Force One. We had a pool uh, of about 12 to 14 reporters on board. We had guests that were on board, members of Congress. We had additional staff. So what we did was we took about uh, a half of those people off and brought the pool down to about five people. And at that point, we left and went on to uh, Offutt Air Force Base, uh, 
the home of STRATCOM, the old Strategic Air Command, where the president could do a, a good deal of, uh, of teleconferencing, get hold of the people he needed to talk to, and in the event there was something really necessary that he had to do to uh, protect this country with using our defenses, uh, that could be done at STRATCOM. And Mark, how, did, how has secured communications aboard Air Force One changed since 9-11? we improved significantly. Uh, unfortunately, this airplane and the communication systems that we had, although they were very, very good, they were really not up to the 21st century. For example, we didn't even have satellite television on board Air Force One, which means when we were up in the air, you couldn't receive television signals. So we could only really uh, be hearing about the, the, the uh, towers falling. We could not get a full situational awareness by using the visual of seeing these buildings come down because we were in the air and there was no ability for us to see a television. When we got back to Washington, within weeks I had satellite television on board the airplane. We also ended up getting the ability to do email. We could not do that on board Air Force One at the time. Fascinating perspective. Mark Rosenker, who was actually director of the White House military office during 9-11. Mark, thank you for that viewpoint. You bet.